Hello, and welcome to our session today at Gala Bounce Forward. I'm delighted to act as um, a facilitator for the for the speak um, speaking session today, which will be presented uh, by Paul Doherty. I'll introduce Paul in just a moment, and we'll be talking about the company merger protocol. And um, I'm I'm delighted to share um, this session and let Paul take over. And some of you may know, um, Paul and I have worked together. We worked together actually for years. So this is one of those great opportunities where I actually know that the individual who's going to take you on this next journey knows what he's talking about. So currently, Paul is owner of Strategy Management Consulting, uh, Consultants Limited, a business that he set up, which really is um, set up to help um, business owners deliver the value of a company merger in year one and really the most important thing there is you know without a loss of key customers and without in a services industry a loss of employees so before that and during his career paul's actually set up two language services companies the language technology center which many of you may know ultimately became a 25 million dollar business which merged into zero language services and also multilingual technology limited which he sold to berlitz during the dot-com era since that time, Paul acted as managing director for the UK business, German business, and Polish and Slovakian companies for Berlitz, had similar roles with Bound, and how we came to know one another. Uh, Paul was running all of the European sales for Lionbridge. We worked very closely together following the acquisition of Bound in 2005. And since then, he's also worked as um, head of sales for SDL in Europe, as well as a strategic consultant to Moravia. So I'm delighted to introduce Paul Doherty to you. Couple quick notes, you are able to ask questions at any time during the session. Uh, there's a Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. And for those of you reading through the questions, you can upvote those questions you find interesting. So um, Paul, I'll let you take over to explain the, pro the, the outline. And I know you've got some really interesting polls that you want to share as well. Yeah, actually, there's going to be a couple of polls which are going to be put online and you can access them either during the presentation or during the Q&A session afterwards. So uh, thanks for the lovely introduction, Paula. So the, I'm just going to share my presentation now. So just let me know if you can see that uh, starting screen. Yeah, take it, everyone can see, yeah. Um, so, Paula, you and I have been through a fair share of um, uh, company mergers, and uh, the theme of today's presentation is, is um, mergers and acquisitions and how to make them a success. And I suspect many people on uh, attending this presentation today will have their own experience, good and bad, of mergers and acquisitions. And so there's some questions in the poll which will uh, allow you to give some information on your own experience. So I've got a lot of... Uh, yeah? Alison, are, are we seeing the slides? No, not yet. So sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know we're not seeing your screen yet. So if you could try the screen share again, please. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Right. So now... Perfect. Yes, thanks. ideal. Thanks. Okay, so I'm still on the cover slide. So I'm, I'm, there's got a lot I want to say, and um, you know, not a lot of time to say. It, and so I'm going to go through uh, this presentation at uh, at a fair lick. But the session has been recorded, and the slide deck is going to be shared, and um, so you'll be able to look at it at your leisure later. So um, M and E activity has never been higher. M&A activity is always there, but sometimes it makes its presence really felt. And this year is a record year for m and deals, as can be seen by this random selection of cuttings from the UK financial press. And m and fever is also impacting the local industry too. So it's not just big players like TransPerfect and Relocalize, but also medium-sized companies are acquiring to become big players themselves and smaller LSPs are acquiring as part of their growth strategy. But before we get carried away with M&A fever, I'd like to say a word of caution. Well, 
two words really, caveat emptor or buyer beware, because the failure rate of mergers is shocking. These, these figures come from a PwC study, which was done on 124 US companies which had merged in 1996. And the figures they, they gathered, the, the data they gathered from talking to the, the business owners one year after the merger was that 85% of those deals had failed to deliver the promised value, which drove the initial acquisition. And 50% actually destroyed shareholder value so that means one plus one did not equal two or two plus five or two and a half. It, it meant one plus one was less than two. 35% uh, delivered minimum value sometimes years later. And quite often that value was not the expected value. It was an unexpected value. So only 15% of business owners said that the, the deal had delivered what they expected it to deliver. Uh, so that... That was a PwC survey 25 years ago, but in the intervening time, not much has changed. I could point you to a KPMG study in 2012, other ones in 2016, and several articles in the Financial Times from this year, which all quote in that range of 50 to 80% failure rate. So if it's so difficult, why do executives do it? And the short answer is rapid growth because m and done well, beats the pants of any other form of growth. But it's the done well part, which is the, is the secret. Um, <clears throat> so I also know a lot of owners who are uh, repeat offenders. I mean, they go through uh, an acquisition, they're disappointed by the results, but they do it again. And it's not because they enjoy the pain or the disappointment of failure. It's because, you know, as executives, they're under... Trend, a tremendous pressure to deliver growth. But so here's what many buyers don't realize. Merging companies successfully is incredibly hard. And the hard work starts when the deal is done. And that's when most executives want to take the foot off the gas because they've spent nine months negotiating the deal and they're, they're exhausted. But that's when you really have to accelerate. Uh, stakeholders, your employees, your customers, they need to be convinced of the wisdom of the deal. They're not going to believe you. It's great just because you say so. And whatever your m &A experience, most of the organization will need expert guidance. And that last point is very important because always, you know, the integration always sounds simple to executives. All you have to do is execute, you know, consolidate overheads, resolve employee conflicts, re-engineer support functions, transfer technologies. All sounds so simple, but down below in the organization, the guys who are meant to do it, um, you know, execution is a black hole of, of uh, distraction, disruption, and chaos. So I like stories. So here's a story which pulls together many of the things that go wrong. And again, I'd be interested to know if this chimes in with your own experience. So it all starts so well. You have the A team, you put your A team on securing the acquisition. So the, you put your best people on doing the due diligence and negotiating the deal. But once the deal is done, that A team is disbanded and it's handed over to the rest of the organization who haven't been involved in the deal to make it happen. But before it's handed over to the rest of the organization, you switch to party mode, you have a party, um, you but you know, you celebrate. But after the champagne has been popped and the pats in the back have been given, the owner is uh, faced with the cold reality of all those hot promises, prospects he made and promises. So the um, the expectations have been set very high and it's very difficult to deliver, especially since, um, you know, there's no real plan. No one's taking accountability for doing it. No one wants to have ownership for actually delivering this deal. Uh, you know, everyone has questions, but nobody's got answers. And uh, you, you're, you're the the teams seem to be spending more time fighting with their new colleagues than focusing on delivering the value of the deal. So although uh, the deal was focused on, say, future growth, as the owner, you're under pressure to deliver results right now. And so you start cost cutting because cost cutting is more immediate and easier to do than delivering future growth. So you start cost cutting. Your employees notice and they fear the worst with good reason. And so they stop focusing on their customers and start focusing on their, their future outside the company. Customers notice, they invite in the competition to minimize their risk. 
the competition love to tell them stories about all the chaos that's going on inside your organization. So they win business, they headhunt your best people, bringing customer information with them, and that creates an exodus of your best people from the company. And the result is lost customers, revenue, and market share. So it can't get any worse, can it? Well, it can, and it does, because the result one year after contract signing is both companies are still at war, very much still a case of us and them. And then one plus one is very much less than two because you've reduced revenue and profit of the combined companies. You've lost key customers, employees, and shareholder value. And as the owner, you wonder why you ever decided to do this deal. So why is the failure rate so high? Well, I've been through a lot of mergers and acquisitions. It's kind of like the story of my professional career. And when I look at the things that go wrong, tends to be seven areas that, you know, and the business owners make one or more of these mistakes or commit one or more of these seven deadly sins. So no clear executive vision. It's not clear to anyone why you're doing this. It's not clear that it's part of a strategy plan. There's no real sense of urgency. So you say things like, oh, well, we're going to get to know each other or we'll let the dust settle or, you know, there's no rush, but there is a rush because you want to have about six to nine months to show that this is a great deal and not a colossal waste of time and money. Poor communication. Poor communication antagonizes the very people you need to make the deal a success. That's your employees and your customers. Key value drivers are not identified. So instead of the focus on what's going to deliver the merger deal, you get a long, you know, soul destroying list of things to do and task you know, task-driven mergers are prolonged mergers and time is the enemy of success. So you don't engage the whole organization so they feel that change has been imposed to them rather than something they've been asked to participate in. There's no focus on integrating core processes and you don't understand how to change culture. It's funny how culture is seen at the same time as being too nebulous to worry about but also too difficult to, to, to contemplate. So having done that analysis, I came up with a company merger protocol, which just is a way of looking at those seven areas and saying, how are we going to deal with them? We know they're going to be problematic. How are we going to plan for the problems that we're going to face? And my idea was to have a merger readiness report, which is done at the same time as due diligence. So you don't wait until the deal is done before you start thinking of, of these areas, you plan it at the same time as you're doing all that hard work and due diligence. And that means out of that, merger readiness report you have a plan which is ready to go on day one full steam ahead as soon as the contract is signed and then there's a post-merger reset to uh, gather together lessons learned that you can apply to future m a activity so i'm just going to go through some of those seven areas that cause problems so compelling future vision what is that well do you have a vision for for your company it helps if you do and it helps if you have a strategy for how you're going to get there because if you do, if you know where you're going and you have a plan to get there, then this acquisition should make sense. It should be part of a story you can tell to your employees and your other stakeholders and your customers. And it should show how this is making a leap forward to that future desired state. You should be able to spell out in great detail what success will look like. In one year from now, this is exactly what it's going to look like. Don't be vague. The more detailed you are, the more people will believe it and, and believe that you know what you're doing. And of course, you explain why it's good news for your customers and employees. So the need for speed. You have to create a real sense of urgency. You only have six to nine months to prove the value of the deal. And that's about the, the attention and motivation span of your organization. People will be fed up with of the integration if it's not completed in that time. So as I said, you've got to have a, a merger, do merger readiness at the, the same time as due diligence, create a plan, put your A team on the plan. You put your best people on doing due diligence and contract negotiation. You buy in, you know, lawyers and accountants, you leave nothing to chance. But when it comes to actually making the deal work, integrating the two companies, then you just, it gets rolled down to the lowest level in, in the organization. Put your best team on it. Deliver early wins because that will make people think you know what you're doing. 
So communication, good communication. There's no secrets, no surprises, no hype, no empty promises. To do communication properly, you're going to have to create a, a, a plan that's more comprehensive than you will imagine. And that's going to have, it's going to be, have content directed at different stakeholders with different frequencies and timescales and channels and different people responsible for it. It's going to be a lot of communication. So you've got to flood the zone with all the messages you want people to hear and leave no room for the rumor mill, for speculation. Uh, you've got to fill it with the messages that, that you want people to hear. So focus on key value drivers. Well, what are key value drivers? They're the initiatives which are going to, the 20% of things you could do which are going to deliver 80% of the merger value. So you're going to have lots and lots of ideas for initiatives. And But to order to, fo uh, to decide what you should focus on, you're going to have to decide which of these initiatives are going to have the highest impact on the merger value to deliver what you want the deal to deliver and which has the highest probability of success. And then that will give you a smaller, more manageable list of initiatives where you can put your precious resources, your time and your people on delivering. <clears throat> and that's got to be your focus in the year one. So other initiatives, ones that will have a very high impact on the merger value, but a low probability of success because they're difficult to do, or maybe you have to develop some software or you have to hire a whole team of uh, you know world-class account managers or salespeople. That makes it more difficult. So you're going to have to, they have to be done, but you have to do them once you've done the ones which are going to deliver the value. Likewise, these ones here, the blue ones, um, they will have a high probability of success, but a low impact on the merger value. So they, you can dust them off after you've done the green ones. So then you'll have a lot of initiatives that look good on paper, but when you do the analysis, find out there's no pot of gold at the end of it. And uh, they're going to burn a lot of uh, uh, time and people's time and money. So those ones, if they're not going to deliver value, then you have to kill them off. So engaging the entire organization, because these are the people that are going to make the, the, the merger a success. So how do you do that? Well, there, luckily for everyone, there is a tried and tested process. It's called ADCAR, Awareness, Desire, Knowledge, Ability and Reinforcement. So. People, when they want change, they always focus on results. You know, we're all very results focused. But to get the results, you have to go back to awareness. People have to understand the need for change. So in the case of a merger or acquisition, that should be part of your strategy. You can also look backwards and say, hey, we've, we've been through a lot of change in the past. So this is just another step in that change journey. It's not something alien that's been imposed on you. It's part of the strain of, of, of the, um, the change journey that we're going through. So people have to understand the need for change. And then they have to, you have to get them to want to support that. And you do that by showing them what's in it for them, not just as individuals, although that's important, but you know, as teams for their colleagues, for their customers. And then so if you can show what's in it for them, then you'll get them wanting to support and participate in the change. And then they need to know what to change. Well, that's easy now because you will have identified those key value driver initiatives, and that's what they're going to work on. So when you talk about ability, people always think training, but the biggest enabler in this situation is time, giving people the time to work on these important things. So they have to be allocated time, not told to fit it in when they can on top of their existing 60 hour week. So for instance, when Bound bought Berlitz, I was MD of Berlitz, they made me MD of Bound, they told me, you're gonna spend 50% of the next nine months, 50% of your time making this merger a success. It didn't take 50% of my time, but the message was very, very clear. This is your number one priority. And then you need the reinforcement, which is feedback. Is it delivering the merger value? You know, what's the the the, the targets we're, it we're aiming towards? Are we on track? What are the measures? Reward and recognizing the people doing this. That's how you make change happen. So if you do those five things, you will get change. If you miss one out, so if people aren't aware, so why are we doing this? You'll get confusion. If they're aware, but there's no what's in it for me, then you'll get resistance. 
uh, if if they're aware and they want to help but they don't know what to do then you'll get fear because nobody wants to screw up if they're aware they want to help they know what they want to do what has to be done but there's no ability especially there's no time hey this is important but we're giving you no time to do it then you get frustration and if you've got all these steps in place but no one's looking at it. There's no feedback. Nobody seems to care. There's no reward or recognition. People will say, well, why should I bust the gut if nobody cares about this? Then you get backsliding. So that's how you engage the organization. So integrating core processes. The purpose of that is to support the key value driver initiatives, which you've already identified. So you've got to push aside any other process change that doesn't have a direct impact on that. And certainly during integration, there's not enough time to reconfigure procedures that were developed over many years. And tinkering simply doesn't work. The law of unexpected consequences will come into play. So I, I like story, so here's another one. So how do you, when you've got all these competing claims on time and resources, how do you decide? Well, this is a picture of the, the UK, the GB, um, Olympic eights rowing team, which won gold in the Sydney Olympics. Uh, but two years previous to that, they came last in the World Championships. And so they had to have a rethink completely about what they were going to do if they were going to win gold, which was a stated goal. And so they had they, they decided they were going to change all their training, their diet, their sleep patterns, everything. And so they had lots of debates and uh, arguments about it. But what kept them focused was answering the question, will it make the boat go faster? So, for instance, they decided not to attend the opening ceremony for the Olympics because they said standing around in a stadium for seven hours would not make the boat go faster. So, as an owner or a team that's part that's going to be integrating two companies, you have to come up with your own question that's as, as clear as this. Will it deliver the merger value in year one? Will it deliver the merger value more quickly? Will it deliver a pot of gold? You've got to come up with something like that, which will make it clear what you have to do. And so coming on to the last area, which is culture change. This is a, a big cause of, of failure. Um, so how important is company culture? Well, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So what does that mean? Well, it means if you have a, a strategy, which is customer focused, customer centric, we're going to put the customer front and center of everything we do. But you have a company culture where, where your employees say things like, you know, customers, you know, they're, they're a bit of a pain, aren't they? You know, bloody customers, they're always complaining. Yeah, why are they always complaining? They don't understand the processes. So why are they why are they always sticking their nose in what we're doing? Why don't they just leave us to get on with it? Bloody customers. If that's your culture, then your nice customer-centric strategy is going to die an early death. But not everyone's convinced. You know, they, they think culture is a kind of bit airy fairy, a bit hippy dippy, you know, vegetable rights and peace. Um, but it's not, it's actually quite concrete. So let me put it in terms that even the dude or his dudeness or El Duderino, if you're not into an entire brevity thing, would understand. Um, culture is the way we do business right here. So how do you change culture? Well, it's about aligning the way you think and behave with the results you want to achieve. Everybody focuses on the results, but fewer people think, well, to get these results, what different behaviours do we have to have? What things do we have to do differently? Quite a few people do that, but very few look back a step behind that and say, you know, how do we want people to see themselves? Because people will act in ways which are consistent with how that they see themselves. So if you want them to change, you have to change the way they see themselves. Or as somebody put it to me once, you've created a habit when it's no longer what you do, but it's who you are. So here are different types of company culture, which you can go through at your own time when you see the slides. But I like the iceberg metaphor. Um, you've got above the water line, which is the way we say things get done, and below the water line, which is the way things really get done. So below the water lines, they're the stories you tell each other. It's the way you treat your colleagues. It's what you say about your customers. It's how you deal with, with success and how you handle failure. And they're the areas that you have to work on because 
that they're the, the, the those values and beliefs and stories are what have to change because culture determines if the end state is achievable. So, um, if you're still not <laughs> if you're still not convinced, and I'm focusing a lot on culture because it's so important, I said I like stories, and I like stories that can be told in one slide. So here's a little story about a typical organization where strategy is the exclusive domain of the executives. It's not really well known across the organization. If you ask people, they don't really know what their strategy is, and they certainly don't know how their job links to the strategy. Uh, executives and uh, do a lot of firefighting, um, <clears throat> and, but there's not very much room for improvement. And the process operators, the people delivering the service, whatever, they have one job, which is to follow the process. But with just a couple of changes, making strategy known across the whole, whole organization, involving everybody in the strategy, and then changing from firefighting to fire prevention by continual improvement, so you're not always fighting the same battles. Well, that does a couple of things. It means the executives have more time to focus on strategy. And the people down here, the process operators, they've gone from having one job to two jobs. The two jobs is now follow the process and improve the process. And when you've got the people down at the process operator level, improving process, that is a real cultural change. So there's an example of cultural change on one slide. And that all gets put into a merger implementation plan, which is ready to go on day one. And that's what's going to deliver your merger value. That's all part of the company merger protocol. And I think that's me. I've got through the presentation yeah. and, and we're now over to the Q&A session. Uh, Paul, fantastic. And, you know, we've got uh, four or five minutes for questions. So well done you, because that was a ton of content. Um, you and I have lived through a lot of big M&A deals. I know myself, you know, it's about 485 million of acquired revenue. And every single thing that you point out was relevant and um, and happened. <laughs> so um, questions right now, please, any of the participants jump on in. We'll start with a question that Alison threw out that I thought was great. So if there were one piece of advice, Paul, that you wanted to give to a prospective buyer, so the person looking at the business, what would it be? Well, it's planned properly. So um, most buyers won't know about the, they'll have an idea of some of them, some of the areas that will cause failure. But so somebody like myself could tell them, this is what the problems you're going to face. So plan for it and plan for it at the same time as you as you plan for the due diligence. So owners are very particular about due diligence. I mean, they, they, they spend a lot of time making sure they're not buying a dud company. Uh, they, you know, but once the deal is done, it's kind of like an afterthought, how are we going to do the merger? So I would say just give the same attention to, to planning for the integration and Put the same level of people. You put really good people on doing due diligence and negotiating the deal. Put great people on making the, the merger work. That's fantastic advice. Paul, I'd love to ask you a question that occurred to me. You know, what's your thought or your opinion on using a third party, an external consultant who drives that post acquisition merger integration process? You and I know we've seen everything from the big bigs mm -hmm. to kind of smaller point um, mm -hmm. so What's your thought about that and the ultimate success of the uh, integration? Well, I mean, I think it's a great idea because I set up a business to do that, you know, to be that third party um, consultant. I, I'd say that the really big players, they're going to use, you know, a PwC or, a, you know, an extern Ernst & Young or something like that. Smaller, medium uh, enterprise smaller companies are more prepared you know they they need help they i think the ceos and owners recognize the need help and they're more open to 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 go to an external uh, consultant and say hey we're going to do this we want to get it right and, all right uh, great. oh sorry go ahead paul no i'm just saying that's i'm, I'm actually doing that currently as well so that's i, I know it works because i'm doing it um, a great question that came in as well. Are there any combinations, any culture amalgamations was the question uh, that will just never work? I mean, it's just not going to succeed. I think you and I know an executive who used to refer to that as, you know, the, the host rejecting the organ. Um, or is there always a way, in your opinion, to some form of harmony? 
Well, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic. I think that with goodwill on both sides, there is a way. Um, but but there are some combinations that are more difficult. You know, the, um, some of the, um, the decision-making processes. So you've got the, uh, we're centralized, everything's decided centrally, and then you've got the decentralized model where we're going to delegate some of these decisions. You know, like Berlitz used to say to me, do what you want, just deliver the profit, right? Um, and so, and, and then you have, you know, as when Bound bought uh, Berlitz, they said, well, you know, Paul, you don't need to worry about uh, accountants and bankers and all that. We'll take care of that. You just, you know, it became more. Stolen, but, but so for each You're of you. are out of time, Paul. I, I hate to cut I off, but I know that the, the platform is going to probably cut us off if we don't. I want to say thank you. This was you put so much effort into the content it was it was obvious and we know you and i that there's going to be a continuation on this topic of some form at our in-person event which we're hopeful to have in san diego in april so i can't wait to get you live on a podium if that works yeah, and uh, allison uh we'd like i think we're ready to close out and say thank you to the attendees and on behalf of the attendees paul my sincere thanks for the work you put into this proposal Thank this you, presentation. Paula. Thank you, and thank you everyone who listened.